Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we have the great pleasure of being joined by the co-hosts of the Vocal Fries podcast, a podcast about linguistic discrimination. That's Carrie Gillen and Megan Figueroa. And they're going. To, we're going to have a conversation about that topic. And this is a, a topic that's particularly important to me. I've been, you know, going on and on with my students about it. Uh, it seems pretty much every class. Uh, so I'm particularly happy to uh, to be able to talk to you guys about it. Uh, first of all, I want to say congrats again, Megan, on oh, defending. Thank you so much. <laughs> that would be on dis- defending her PhD dissertation mm-hmm. for those of you who don't, you know follow Megan on <laughs> yeah. um, following the, the drama on uh, Twitter. <laughs> yes, congratulations. That's Thank such a big so deal. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah. welcome both of you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Hi. We're happy to be here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, virtually, I'm happy that I'm not where you are, where the snow is. No, no offense, of course. <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah, that's... We're, we're pretty sick of the snow. At the totally moment. fair. There was a, a huge snowstorm on Wednesday, which dropped about 10 inches of snow. Ooh, uh, there was God. a snowstorm on Saturday before that, which was another maybe five inches of snow. Wow. It was minus 12 overnight oh. Celsius. Oh. I mean, it's just... it's. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the weather is cold. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I know spring is slow up here in Sudbury, but this is slow even for Sudbury. Yeah. <laughs> <So I'm blessed. laughs> yeah. Um, my 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 mom was complaining about the snow in Calgary today. <laughs> oh yeah. And I'm like, well, it is Calgary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, to start off, uh, your podcast is wonderful, and I found it a, just about Christmas time, I think I found oh, it, cool. and yeah. I'm caught up on the backlog and really enjoying Thank it. You. Hey, um, thank you. But let's, let's start from the basics. Um, your podcast is about linguistic discrimination. So do you have a capsule definition of what linguistic discrimination is? I guess it's like the sneaky way to be racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic <laughs> or whatever ism or phobia mm-hmm. you have. Mm-hmm. So yep. it's 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 doing the same things as other types of let's say let's take uh, gender discrimination. So you're mm-hmm. lot, it's very easy to be sexist. There's lots of things in the culture that support sexism, but we can do it through linguistic discrimination. So we can say, oh. Vocal fry is horrible. Listen to how horrible women are. They speak the wrong way. First of all, <laughs> men do it too. But even if it were only women who were doing it, we would ju- it would still be sexist because we are picking on a, a thing that one gender does, or in this case, not just one gender does. Yeah, and I feel like um, the the good comparison for linguistic discrimination for me is that it's kind of like cockroaches, and if there were like a nuclear war or you know nu- <laughs> whatever, it would still they would still like be here. And I feel like linguistic discrimination is the thing that's going to survive unless we start talking yeah. about it. Like it, it's just something that or stop talking. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> as long as we're still talking. <laughs> Yeah, I feel yeah. like um, it's like Carrie said, it's the sneaky one. It's the one where in really progressive, mm-hmm. otherwise progressive circles, we'll still hear things that are very discriminatory linguistically. So th- there's a bunch of things there I want to pick up on <laughs> uh, in a moment, but let's stay broad picture for a minute. Um, for both of you, where did your particular interest in this topic come from? What is your background in in linguistics and and where does this particular interest come from? Well, I mean, I, so I'm a formal linguist by training and um, I worked mostly with indigenous languages of Canada. So like Squamish and Inuktitut and a few others. Um, And I, you know, I see a lot of discrimination towards those people in general. Um, Mm -hmm. But for the linguistic discrimination aspect, really it, I, it's just always something that I worried about in classes. It's something that I think linguists are 
required to fight against. And I did in the classroom, but once I was no longer in the classroom, I had no place to really <laughs> shout at the clouds. <laughs> Mount that soapbox. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I decided yeah. I, I had done a TEDx talk on this topic and I realized like that was a, that was a room full of people who really wanted to be, you know, wanted to care about other people and didn't want to be racist or sexist or whatever. And, mm. and they didn't know, like mm. what I told them was brand new to right. them. And, mm. and I realized, okay, I really do need to do a better job of bringing this to the people. And, uh, at some point I thought, Hmm, a podcast would be a good way to do it. And I just didn't want to do it on my own. So I asked Megan if she wanted to join. Mm. So that's my story. Yeah. And for me, um, it, I actually, I entered the field of linguistics because this is, um, linguistic discrimination is something that's like been pretty traumatic for me over like my lifetime because my, my father is a native Spanish speaker and, um, he elected not to teach me how to speak Spanish as a child. Like he withheld it from me because of the way he was treated for being a Spanish speaker, like corporal punishment, right. In in elementary school in Arizona for speaking Spanish, um, and, and all of the, 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 you know, racist things that you can imagine, like go back to Mexico type of stuff. Um, so you don't want to like pass on that trauma to your child. Um, and, and I miss Spanish, the Spanish I never had every day. And I just wanted to understand how bilingualism worked, um, how language worked. I wanted to just understand it better. And that's why I started, um, studying linguistics. That's interesting because that's sort of the two two different ends of the spectrum in that, I mean, I, I'm not saying, Carrie, that you weren't interested or didn't care about these things beforehand, but um, I do think that's a trajectory that a lot of people start in language mm -hmm. for other reasons. Yeah, definitely. And then hopefully at least grow towards an understanding of this as a particular aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I think linguists tend to be much more aware of these issues than non-linguists yes. as a general rule. But then the other direction, Megan, to come from having recognized it as a lived experience mm -hmm. and then looking for the academic um, explanations and discussions. and Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, sort of the two ends. Yeah, of definitely. The yeah, I didn't yeah. think about it before I entered linguistics. I mean, I'm a middle class white person from Canada. Like, it just didn't occur yeah, to me yeah. to, to worry about. Yeah, it. and I, I, I certainly am you know, sympathize and empathize with that because I'm, so I don't study linguistics specifically. I study language though. I'm a classicist. So I study Latin and Greek and learned, you know, a fair amount about language, but not linguistics exactly. Mm -hmm. But I came from a household with a mother who was an editor, you know, that was her job. Mm -hmm. And a father who was just generally a pedant. <laughs> I, mean, I mean that in a loving way, you understand, but yes. you know, like the dictionary and the encyclopedia were always beside the table, but dinner, like that was the, it was a household wow. of, you know, people who cared about language and cared about, cared about rules, but not necessarily only rules by any means. They weren't, I mean, they were prescriptivist in some ways, but, but not in a nasty way, but just in that sort of general everyday way that people are. And we were all quite proud of our linguistic competence mm -hmm. you know yeah. we were a very linguistically competent family we still are a very linguistically competent family um uh both in terms of number of like my dad is very good at picking up languages number of languages we can speak ability to think about language analytically you know all those things mm -hmm. use it my mother's a poet as well um you know a published poet and my dad worked with computer programming so you know language was a big feature of our household mm -hmm. but i didn't think at all about the ways in which you know i was just like everybody else who knows enough grammar to be dangerous. <laughs> I was uh, yeah. really good about learning what the rules were and I edited other people's work very well and that was very helpful, but I also felt I was quite a lot better than them for knowing it all. Right. <laughs> you know, deep down, yes. yeah. obviously I was a better person <laughs> because I understood these things. And then I went and took Latin in high school and that just made it worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I went out and studied Latin and classics in university in a very linguistically oriented or language oriented department, classical philology oriented department mm -hmm. at U of T. And that didn't help much with snobbery. <laughs> I was just saying. It did so not, what I'm it, hearing is Latin makes you a jerk. Is yeah. that what I'm hearing? No. Yeah, uh, um, and come take my classes, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, let's just say that Latin doesn't necessarily suppress naturally jerkish tendencies. Yeah. <laughs> Good way to put it. <laughs> but not that's not actually universally true because in <laughs> fact as i started teaching latin i did start to think a lot more about language rules and and it is true that once you start learning the latin rules and then realizing that the english rule rules are formed so much from misapplications of latin rules to english yeah. you yeah. do start or i did start seeing wait a minute I'm not so sure about these languages, <laughs> but I will credit a lot of it to Mark because while I was an undergrad <laughs> in classics and we started going out and you were doing medieval studies mm -hmm. and developing your own attitudes, which I, I'll let you tell your own story, mm -hmm. but I don't know that you necessarily had those thoughts from a young age yourself no. necessarily either. But, you know, we we spent a lot of time arguing about Old English versus Latin grammar and medieval Latin versus classical Latin because we are cool. We are really cool. <laughs> but, I was just thinking when you were saying that, I was like, that's a relationship. Like, if, if you love it that much, that's awesome. Yeah. I would just, like, not like my partner to talk about linguists. <laughs> Stay away. Uh, we, we, we did the, like, argue about how to pronounce Latin over dinner a lot wow. <laughs> and we were dating and, and, and moved in together and just kind of got worse um and now we podcast about it <laughs> but but you know so i i took this journey from a and and in fact you know then as i got more aware of a lot of stuff and have become quite passionate about it and then you know it's become a topic of conversation with my family for instance with my mother who you know does know all the rules and spent her life quite properly you know she's editing publications for the national gallery of canada of course she should be prescriptivist in that sense right, right? like that's the right context mm -hmm. for yeah for knowing the rules and applying them strictly um that's appropriate there but you know we've had a lot of conversations over the last 10 years i'd say about this and i think we've changed our mind on a number of things though she understandably <laughs> clings to certain things that she does you know language peeving has not ended right in my house family household but it, it they don't say a lot around us anymore no. <laughs> <laughs> and mom if you're listening i love you i, I know you don't really understand podcasts, so you probably aren't but just in case <laughs> yeah my my journey with language has been rather complex <laughs> to say the least because i'm an anglophone but uh it english is not the first language of either of my parents right it was the mm -hmm. common language between them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, I grew up in an English environment, English mm -hmm. peers. Mm -hmm. But your father's first language was Tamil. Tamil. And my mother's first language is French. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I had a kind of weird uh, relationship to the language growing up and going through school in particular, because they thought I was, uh, you know, had some sort of uh, language disability for a while. Mm -hmm. I learning disability. I couldn't spell mm -hmm. properly, and I had difficulty learning French. And uh, so I had, had a weird kind of relationship. And it's sort of, you know, I, I, I get the irony that I ended up, you know, doing language professionally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, you know, when I finished uh my phd i was that guy who you know really hammered the prescriptivist rules and student writing and all of that and it took me a while to unlearn a lot of that yeah. stuff mm -hmm. yeah it does did a take lot a while yeah writing yeah. courses right i did i taught a lot of writing courses first out and uh yeah <laughs> well and, and the, it, it's such a complicated you, know, you guys have talked about this on your podcast but it's a complicated thing because if you're teaching a writing course for students at a university mm -hmm. You don't necessarily serve them by saying, hey, like, as long as your thoughts get across on the page, you're languaging right. You know, yeah. because they're going to walk out of your class and fail their next exactly. course. Yeah, it's, so, it's definitely frustrating because that's exactly the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and also, you know, linguistic um, lack of discrimination is not necessarily saying people shouldn't be contextually aware of how to use language. Because, of course, that's part of being human, too. Right. So it's all a big, complicated mess when you're in that sort of yeah, position. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think in when you're at the at university is a very is a place where you have to think about it hard. Yeah. And we're both still thinking about how to 
walk that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I taught community college English, I made a huge deal about saying like, (laughs) this is the, there are systemic reasons why we have to do, have to learn this, have to add this to our toolkit. Like I wanted them Mm -hmm. to know that it was nothing. It had nothing to do with the way that they spoke. Um, It had everything to do with the system, right? Like their, their powers, um, that be that make it so the quote unquote standard English is the standard English. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think that and, was the best way I could do it was to make sure that they mm-hmm. knew that I knew that I wasn't, um, there to change them. Also, it, it's just a skill. It's it doesn't make you a good or a bad person. I think we really need to do a better job of right. saying that like, yeah, sure. Academic writing or even non-academic, but still formal writing. It's maybe useful to have, but it's still just a skill. Right. Mm-hmm. I've I've actually explicitly said to my students sometimes it's essentially yeah. a second language. You're learning a second yeah. language. You're learning a written form and a and a spoken form, perhaps depending on the context you want to use it in. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a second language, and it's a second language that's quite related to your potentially first language, and you know that'll help. It's not as right. hard as learning a completely new language, but when I'm, you know, marking your essay and you're writing your essay, you're writing to me in this, I mean, I know it's register. I know that's linguistically what it is, but I think approaching it as if it's just another language and it doesn't need to change the way you speak your first language. Right. But you've learned a skill of a second language, one that has the benefit of being widely adopted, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because that's the one benefit of a standard English. There's lots of drawbacks to it, but a benefit is it's a koine. It's a, it's a common language. I was thinking about, um, how it's true that it's not as hard as learning a second language. Um, but that's a, um, there in some ways it is harder because mm-hmm. there are like some, um, accessibility issue things. Like I think about like dyslexia and all of these things that yeah. make it harder mm-hmm. to learn this skill because if, you know, um, people learn their native language from birth, no problem, as long as, you know, there's no um, sort of like language impairment or any other um, Mm -hmm. things like that going on. Cognitive issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we learn our language, no problem. Um, Learning to write a certain way is is really hard for some people, and that was actually hard for me to learn because it comes naturally Mm to me. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm learning all these things about uh, ableism, that have really opened yeah. my eyes up to how hard it can be for some people. Yeah, and I suppose also the fact that it is mostly the same, but you have to remember these slight differences in rules, mm-hmm. you know, that that's that poses its own problems. Yeah, when people talk about sp- learning a second language that's really close to their own, sometimes it can be more tricky. Yeah, so it, it is complicated, but, you know, I have come to the point now, for instance, I teach I teach intro Latin a lot, and intro and, and upper year Latin, And um, frankly, and if any of my students are listening, please don't take this the wrong way. But frankly, most of my students don't learn Latin by the end of it. Right. Um, Not very much. I mean, it's just too, you know, it's a big, hard thing to learn. And they just don't have enough time and they take one year of it. And what are they going to learn from it? Not very much Latin. Yeah. I hope they find that comforting, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry. You're not going to learn everything in that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, and if they go on, they learn more. But if they don't, so, but so from a, you know, my course objectives point of view, I don't necessarily write this in the course objectives, though I kind of put part of it in. Um, For me, if they walk out of the class understanding the way language works or way a language works, that's a more lasting skill. Mm -hmm. It's a skill they're going to be Mm -hmm. able to more fully get in one year than classical Latin. Um, And so, you know, and most students come in with no or very little formal training in grammar Mm -hmm. Um, no formal analysis of grammar, no terminology for grammar, no, un, you know, they just, they, I'm lucky if they know what a noun and a verb are. Yeah. Generally. Mm-hmm. And now those are not, none of this is moral, but in terms of discussing language, it is hard if you don't have any terminology. Yes. <laughs> it's difficult if you do not have a common frame of reference. So I spend a lot of time talking about English grammar, mm-hmm. a lot of time talking about English grammar, but I've become, and I, I've become more and more and more explicit about saying, like, I'm going to teach you this or tell you this, and here's how English works. And here's a rule that you will have heard. And here's why it's wrong or right Mm -hmm. or both. And here's why people, you know, here's what people will say about it. And here's, you know, 
this is why people say, here, I've just taught you how prepositions work in Latin. Now you understand why people say that English should never end a sentence with a preposition. It's because Latin can't. Yep. And isn't that weird? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, those are different languages and why does that matter? Um, and But I've become really explicit about saying like, I'm teaching you these rules, not so you can go to your friend and tell them they're doing this wrong, because I am not teaching you to be a bunch of jerks, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> like, I am really straightforward about it. Like, I am not telling, and then I'll say, people will tell you not to write like this or to tell you not to do this. And now you know why they're wrong to be such a jerk to you. <laughs> Yay! Right. But that doesn't mean you're allowed yeah. to be a jerk back, <laughs> you know? But, but like, I didn't, I didn't used to be, when I was first teaching it, I just taught the Latin, the English grammar. And it took me a little while to move to the being so explicit about like, that I'm, I'm teaching you tools and this is interesting. And, you know, history of English grammar is fascinating and they're fascinated by it. But this is not about telling you that you are going to walk out of this like better than your friends because they didn't take Latin. Right. Because that's exactly still, I'm sorry to say that's still how teaching Latin, learning Latin and Greek is often sold yes. to students in a uh, lot of classics departments uh -huh. across the country and the, you know, classics programs in high school in the U S and stuff, you know, learn this and you'll be better at language than your friends and you'll know stuff that they don't, uh, you know? Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, can not, see that. Maybe not exactly than your friends, but learn right. and you'll get the tools. You'll be better at English. You'll be better at English grammar. You'll know what's right and wrong. And that's like 300 year old, uh, classism really. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's still alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we have, we have all, all sorts of problems in our discipline, but I won't get into all those. We have <laughs> other, other podcast episodes about that. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea yeah. that that was like a selling point. Um, oh yeah. For oh Latin. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's, and, and I mean, you know, it's not, it's that's framed wrong but it's not wrong in the sense that yes learning latin will help you if you're especially if you're monolingual it'll definitely help you understand language learning because any learning language, any second language will, will open you. up yeah. your understanding of how language works that's just yeah, a thing right. and the grammar grammatical terminology that's commonly used in english does derive from the same grammatical terminologies sure. for latin so when you learn one set it's transferable so you know those things are true Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just about whether it makes you a better person or not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So, yeah. So we, I, I still remember the argument I had with my thesis advisor about whether or not I could split infinitives in oh, my thesis. Because yeah. he would go through and correct every split infinitive. No. And by this point, Mark was <laughs> oh. very firm about how, uh, you know, this was a stupid rule. And, and I had, I had absorbed this this new gospel and uh and and was so argued with him and he was an oxford trained you know classicist uh -huh. and he finally got to the point where he said look you're right of course of course it's dumb but listen i don't want anybody reading your your dissertation to have anything to criticize you about yeah i'm trying to clear so i said all right fine i you know I accept that line of reasoning and I went through and I took out all my split <laughs> infinitives and I said, for the dissertation, I'll do that. When it's time to submit, you know, articles from this thing, I'm splitting every infinitive I can find. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he said, all right, that's fine. That's out of my hands. <laughs> Although I wonder if like reviewers are going to fix it too, because I just got some revisions back from a journal and oh, oh yeah. my gosh, the things that they want to fix are so frustrating <laughs> yeah I guess, no i know I mean, actually yeah. i think that's that no that has happened to me yeah. for sure journal yeah. styles and yeah i think actually it's the know, copy you have editors to sort of pick your battles the copy yeah. editors yeah. will fix it for you and you won't even notice yeah. Mm -hmm. oh okay. yeah, yeah yeah that happened to me recently when i was writing a course on oh, yeah. the history of the english language <laughs> <laughs> and I would do things like start sentences with and, and they get corrected. And I decided which one, which battles were course. worth. It, it was, was an, an online, online course. course. Yeah. yeah. So it was going through a whole editorial, uh, you know, system. And I had to decide, okay, which battles are worth fighting and which ones aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because yeah. sometimes it's like, okay, it sounds good either way. It's, so whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. switch it around if you want, who cares? Yeah, you exactly. Know, follow a style. Yeah. And then other times, like with split infinitives, Personally, I think there are infinitives that need to be split because mm -hmm. otherwise the adverb goes with the wrong word. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds terrible. Stupid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You don't say to go um, boldly. It just sounds bad. Yeah. I mean, this is why your podcast is of great interest to us because <laughs> it is something that is an ongoing, like it really does come up again and again in my Latin classes and 
all my classes because I, you know, have my shticks that I do for every class regardless <laughs> of what I'm teaching. <laughs> so some of these come up everywhere, but definitely comes up in my Latin class. And then you've, Mark's been teaching, um, well, this history of an English course in particular. Yeah. And then I guess, and also, I guess it ends up coming up in your Greek and Latin roots of English. Oh, it course. does because yeah. it, it uh, reflects. So the, the course looks at uh, English vocabulary that comes from Greek and Latin roots mm -hmm. And I have to keep telling them, but look, this is betraying a certain um, classism from that goes way back, uh, where you know technical terminology is based on Greek and Latin because people who are getting uh, expensive educations, upper class educations, were learning Latin and Greek, mm -hmm. and whereas other people mm -hmm. weren't. Right. So it's 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 definitely kind of exclusionary language and sometimes very intentional. Oh, it was 100% intentional back then. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and today. Yeah. But yeah. So it comes up a lot. Yeah. Even the textbook perpet perpetuates this. Cause mm -hmm. she says, notice how these words are more elegant. Oh no. What? Oh, no, no. Of this. It's like... <laughs> no. <laughs> so I have to always stop and, you know, counter those, yeah. those little offhand comments. Wow. That would just, yeah. I, my, my head would explode in the classroom. <laughs> Right, Carrie, your head would literally explode. <laughs> literally, it would like yeah. explode like all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> I did just listen to the most recent episode. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's really frustrating, and I'm sure that mm -hmm. textbooks of all sorts are just like filled with with comments like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh for sure. Oh. Yeah, and in some ways, I sometimes. As long as you notice them, I can I kind of welcome them because they do give you the opportunity to That's talk true. about it. Yeah. Yes. You know, it raises the point and it gives you and it also gives you an opportunity to engage with the issue of like just because it's in the textbook doesn't mean it's authoritative. That's true. And just because, you know, like so it helps you do that talking about power dynamics and mm -hmm. stuff. But you know, a few of those are good for doing that. <laughs> if it's every other page, yeah. <laughs> it just drives you crazy. And also not every professor is gonna be doing that. Right. No, and that yeah, let's go back that, that more systematically. That's yeah. A this goes here. back to my cockroach uh, <laughs> thing. Like, mm -hmm. These are they yeah. keep surviving because people aren't going to challenge them. I mean, people like us will, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully more people will continue to start to challenge these things that they find in textbooks. Where a lot of students do come to college assuming that textbooks are going to be the authority. Like, I mean, I'm a first generation college mm -hmm. student. Mm -hmm. I I didn't you know have I didn't really have. Um, the tools to question authority like that. Like, I was like, of course, this is going to yeah. be like, you know, the word of God, basically, right? Like, Ooh. I listen, you know, you got to listen to the textbook, but um, you got to teach them critical, like reading skills, right? Like, everything can be, you know, you got to be critical of everything. Well, and I came not specifically first generation. I mean, my, my, both my parents did, uh, did university, but um, again, we're a very bookish household. So books, you know, Default to books are better than yeah, people. True. Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I had to say, make a statement about my upbringing, I, in fact, would basically say that as a child, I firmly believe that books were better than people. <laughs> but that totally reminds me of the, the speech recognition uh, episode that we did where um, people mm -hmm. kind of... Um, without thinking about it, maybe think that technology isn't biased, but of course it is because people are the ones that mm -hmm. created it. So books are written by mm -hmm. people and, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. And, and worse, at least with like computers, computers pick up bias better than humans do. So they, yeah. they actually make it worse. It's true. And they, yeah, they expand it and they regularize it and they enshrine it. Yeah. In their, yeah. in their systems. So this sort of also reminds me of something that um, one of my friends and colleagues at U of T actually said recently or posted on Facebook recently how he, you know, he's always been trying to fight against linguistic discrimination as, as linguists try to do. Mm -hmm. But he realized that one of the things he really needs to bring out is that it's not just a reflection of racism and sexism, et cetera, but it also actually helps to support all of these mm -hmm. systems yeah. and like right. really effectively. And so that's one of the reasons we need to dismantle it. It's, it's not just a reflection. It really is supporting it. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it construct and it constructs it in yes. people and that's really problematic. And it, it becomes a sort of reflex mm -hmm. so that you, you, you don't stop to question what you're saying and how you're saying it. Mm -hmm. And it's supported by society, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I mean, this 100%. is why you say it's the sneaky one. Yeah. It's uh, not just in yeah. the general 
systematic ways, systemic ways that racism and sexism are, are supported by the society, which they are, but in really explicit ways. Yeah. Like you're given a gold star by people on Twitter <laughs> for pointing out the you're, typos. Oh, I hate yeah. that. You're given so a much. gold. Yeah. Stop doing you're that. You're given people. a gold star. <laughs> You you know, every time you complain about a mispronunciation on the radio, <sighs> you're told you're smart. Yeah. Every time you complain about people who don't understand how to use whatever right. word or yeah. a whole bunch of people say, yes, that was smart. That was clever. That was intelligent. Mm -hmm. That was eloquent, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, whereas if you say that person is, uh, you know, stupid because they're a different color. People do not. I mean, there might be subsets, but most people do not say, oh, gold star, right. well done. Right. Yeah. At least not loud, right? <laughs> you, yeah, exactly. I, well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of implicit stuff that goes on, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. but you don't get explicit praise for saying that. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Except from Nazis. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the linguistic thing comes and, from, yeah. and you said this right at the beginning, comes from progressives, comes from all sorts of yep. people who are, mm -hmm. you know, who you want the praise from right. because they're on your side and they're... Yeah, they yeah that's what makes it so dangerous is that mm. everyone buys into it and it's people that you like who are supporting it. And yeah, we have to, we have to fight against it. We have to stop this <laughs> because mm. otherwise nothing is really going to change. We're, we're only going to get slightly better. In order for us to really get better, yeah. we have to at least attack this one thing mm -hmm. yeah and take that energy yeah. that like you used to use hopefully used to use to like correct people's your and yours <laughs> and like uh take that energy and be like oh no you know we don't need to correct people when they do this because x y and z right because i yeah, used to yeah be use it to correct language policing yeah. rather than to language police because yeah, i used yeah. to be yeah, like stop. that yeah yeah me too stop being a language police yeah. for sure <laughs> who guards the guards who polices the language police right. that's what we need i'll write that in, I'll write that in latin and send it yeah. that's nice <laughs> that's, <a motto. laughs> that's a great motto i love it <laughs> because yeah i mean language policing is that's that's what that is and it's it's just plain wrong yeah. <laughs> it, should, it should be unacceptable so mm -hmm. let's stop accepting it yep yeah. And and that's, as you said about your TEDx talk, I mean, so often, and, and this is what, you know, to do my parents' credit, like, while they still have emotional reactions to certain terminology and whatever, and I mean, we all do, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, they really have, I think, at least um, consciously accepted the premise that language policing is classism. Yeah. At the very mm -hmm. least, you know, That's and, good. and yeah. all the arisms. But, you know, they, they both of them have said, oh, no, I see what you like. I get I get what you're saying. Uh, that doesn't mean that individual specific moments don't put their teeth on edge but as yeah I said, like that's okay i have lots of stuff i hate yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but that's because i hate stuff that's not because it's wrong <laughs> yeah exactly yeah all linguists no. will admit to you that they have like some language peeve that bothers them but they only say it to other linguists because we don't want it to be per perpetuated as the truth it's just you know mm -hmm. our internal feelings about yeah, it exactly i don't like mustard yellow either Yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> like, but it's not it's not an immoral color <laughs> i just don't like it <laughs> <laughs> like, that's nothing so so if there's language usage i don't like and and you know, so i think my mom's basically come to that point where she's willing to say i don't like this and then she'll sort of follow it up with i know it's okay but i really don't like it yeah, that's better <laughs> okay. that is definitely better that's where we want people to get to at the very least <laughs> yeah exactly i think i think if we were because then what you aren't moved to do is to then apply it to other people yeah you know you aren't, you aren't telling other people they're wrong you aren't exactly yeah. you aren't mocking other people for their use mm -hmm. of it right for instance and i guess the other thing you can do is, is sort of model the sort yeah. of behavior you want to see so especially when you're you know in a position of privilege sure. mm -hmm. um you know i i try to you know tweet in everyday language mm -hmm. i don't you know kind of put down the academic ease mm -hmm. when i'm you know in online mm -hmm. communications because again it's it, it it's a subtle way of you know if I were to do that, if I were to, you know, always write in these, you know, very stuffy, formally correct. You know that you English. just used the subjunctive in that sentence. You did, that's true. <laughs> if I were, yeah. I yeah. still use the subjunctive too, yeah. so. Me too. I know. <laughs> I know. It, it's, I was, I, I mean, you're totally, but you're, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I couldn't help pointing that that's out. Because, true. because actually that speaks to something I do in class, because I can't, you know, everyone's idiolect. 
what we're all saying is what your ideolect is, is perfectly Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and shouldn't be subject to being changed. And for better or for worse, my ideolect is really academic. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I started reading adult books at age six and I never gave it up. And it just, and I, and I did Latin in high school and it broke me. Like, mm. I don't speak English like people really speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Um, I mean, I, I, obviously I speak in formal English and stuff, but like I do use the subjunctive and I do use erstwhile as a set, as a word. <laughs> like nobody uses erstwhile. Like that's ridiculous. And so what I have taken to doing in my classes is I will like often I'm pointing out a Latin word and, and giving them an English derivative to help mm-hmm. them remember the vocabulary. And three quarters of the time when I do that, they don't know the English mm-hmm. word. Or other times I'll talk about a rule or whatever. And I'll say, if you are broken and you've read too much Latin translation in lobes from the 19th century, this may become part of your speech. I say lest. I say I don't want to go to the store lest I get too tired. <laughs> English speakers don't say that. I say that because that's how I translate the particle ne in Latin and it's stuck. Right. And so but like I say that to them in, in class, I say it and I say it doesn't make me smarter. In fact, it makes me less comprehensible to other people and I sound like a dork. <laughs> but it's what I am, that's fine. Yeah. So the point is what I'm trying to model to them is, yeah, I am going to talk in a way that sounds kind of fancy. When I get going, talking about epic or something, I do. I can hear it in my got Ciceronian rhetoric in my blood. Like it's it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just true. Mm-hmm. But what I'm trying to say to them is this doesn't make me smarter. It doesn't make me clever because I can do this. Um, these are things that happen because of what I've read and the mm-hmm. what I've absorbed and that's neither better nor worse. And in fact, some ways it's worse because no one understands me sometimes. And so I'm trying to like, I, I, I can't necessarily model, like, I'm not going to try to put on, you know, urban speech or something. No, right? that's, that's the other <laughs> There's thing. There's a whole you bunch should, of reasons I shouldn't, shouldn't do that. put on language that isn't yours. Yeah. But at the same time, so I don't want to tell them like, but try to emulate me, mm-hmm. right? Like, I'm so smart. I'm up at the front of the room and I'm... And, talk like I talk. So I'm trying to sort of be, I think the more explicit I can be, the more I call attention to it almost, Mm -hmm. the more helpful that is. Yeah. But going back to the Twitter thing, (laughs) I mean, if you did use overly Mm -hmm. academic language, you would be using Twitter wrong. Like that's just not how people use Twitter. Not even academics. Academics use Twitter in a very casual way. Yeah. Yeah. Though there are some, (laughs) there are some. Yes. But don't they sound wrong? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, they do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah and that's that's the other thing i think is so helpful is if you can think in terms of genre sometimes mm. context is more what linguistics call it i as a literary person i tend to think of genre you know like what is the genre you're trying to do whether it's speaking or writing and what's mm-hmm. appropriate to that even within your own you know code switch according to genre as opposed to uh so your cockroach analogy <laughs> I wanted to come back to that because I have yeah. I've written in my little less list of potential topics the question, is it inevitable? Mm. Oh, uh-huh. Is linguistic discrimination on some level or another? Now, this is, you know, this is a, a wider question and a depressing one. Right. Is it as inevitable as other kinds of discrimination? I suspect yes, but I really don't want it to be true. Yeah. Like if you if you if you go into a, a relatively small community and, and you want to like figure out how the language works, there's like different dialects almost no matter how small mm-hmm. the community is, mm-hmm. and then the people yeah the people are like oh that's that other dialect, mm-hmm. and just the way that they talk about it is just so distressing. So I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we can find a way to actually stop linguistic discrimination completely. But part of me thinks we can only do better and not be fixed 100%. Yeah, and I, w- I, I wish I could counter Carrie's uh, slightly uh, not totally positive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel the exact same way. Mm-hmm. I think it is inevitable and we can only do better. And we're trying, Carrie and I are trying to make it a little bit better <laughs> for you know people in the world yeah. by saying this is a thing. And you're, you're not necessarily, I mean, you're not a bad person if you have these thoughts. We had these thoughts before we started mm-hmm. looking closer. So I guess that's all we can do. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's inevitable in the same way that people categorizing other people is inevitable. Yeah. And that once you've categorized, you 
rank. You mm-hmm. know, like that. I, I do think that that is a, a, a basic social impulse. Yeah, I do too. I've had arguments with people about this. Like some people mm-hmm. think that hierarchy is not inevitable, but I just think that humans like hierarchy. Well, it's a cognitive thing too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's an organizational structure. It's a way of simplifying yeah. your world. Yep. Um, I mean, maybe the hierarchy, I think the organizational like subdivision is inevitable. I, I, I really do think that because we just can't function in a world that isn't subdivided. Like, how do you mm-hmm. even begin to take in process information if you can't right. subdivide yeah. it? Is hierarchy inevitable? Mm. Um, maybe not, but it, but it's it's so widespread that it's really hard to say. <laughs> well, you just said, like, how to subcategorizing and then ranking. And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if yeah. we if if it was just subcategorization, if it was just subcategorization, I think we could just accept it and move on, and we wouldn't have to worry about it. But if if we do rank, if that mm. is what we do, like no matter what, then it's a harder task. Yeah. Well, and so. subcategorization isn't a problem in its own right. I mean, I don't want no. anyone to forget that I'm Latina. You know, like I don't want that mm-hmm. to be erased. It's just the same as saying mm-hmm. you're colorblind. Like that's not what we want. Um, right. No. It's the ranking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like everybody says that Canadians sound like they talk, say, a boot. And obviously that's not true. And I, I feel know. deeply, deeply offended. By <laughs> I, I've decided to not be offended that Americans think like that no. because I'm they just either. don't hear it. They don't hear it correctly. It's, so it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's whatever. It's, it's their, because their ears don't work right. It's not, <laughs> it's not their fault. Well, they're just not used to that combination of sounds. Like no, they don't have that diphthong. So no, it, no, it's, it's, a, it's a distinction they don't make. And, and no, I, 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 I'm not offended by it either. It, it does amuse me though. That, <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the few things that I, as an extraordinarily privileged person yeah. can complain about being, uh, finding offensive. <laughs> Like, true. <laughs> like there's not many things I could be like, how dare they? Other than <laughs> sexism. But even on that, I don't get much. I, I'm, you know, I have a lot of positions of power that's insulate me from a lot of those things. So really that one's, that's my big one. I'm able to be the underdog on. <laughs> well, and just, you know, someone will say, oh, you're so cute. You yeah. sound Canadian. Yeah, I know. I don't even have that much to complain about. <laughs> it's not like we get in trouble for it. <laughs> Though I have been mocked for how I say pasta. Yeah, me too. Oh, Mock yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, what are you even saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have some nachos with that, and then <laughs> that one I don't have. I have nachos, <laughs> but I have pasta. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, just thinking of the vocal fry thing and the way that it's specifically targeted at women, it plays into an already existing stereotype yep. that women. I mean, really what it comes down to is it comes out of the stereotype of women speak too much yep. and therefore policing women the way women speak is basically a proxy of saying to women, shut up. Yes, exactly. Right? Yes, they speak too much and what they speak about is frivolous. Yeah. So, the, you know, that's the, yeah, yeah. the underlying argument, essentially. So yeah. tell them to shut up and tell them that the what they're saying is of no value. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it hurts my ears. And it hurts my ears, yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't tell you how many people continually say this to me <laughs> even after I tell them what I am about our podcast. Mm-hmm. And like they're just like, "Oh no, it's I'm I'm sorry. I just I just really hate vocal fry." And I'm like, "I would love to have a recording of your voice because I bet yes. you do it too." Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would say between the two of us, Mark does it more than me <laughs> just because of the way you produce I, I edit the podcast, so I listen to a lot of this. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. You also say like and you know more than I do. So there. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. And not that it matters because there's nothing wrong with that, is there's there? There's nothing wrong with either of <laughs> not those that things. there's anything wrong with that. Well, that was another thing that came up recently. So, you know, I'm in some podcast groups and the things that they complain about are sometimes... I, you know, it comes mm-hmm. down to this linguistic discrimination. But one one guy was like, oh, how do I get how do I stop myself from saying um all the time? I have to edit so much of it out. And I was like, well, you know, you don't have it's OK to use these um, filler words. And there's a reason why we do it. It's so that mm-hmm. we're not giving up the conversational ground. You, I'm still talking and I'm letting you know I'm still talking mm-hmm. and that's OK. And if you want to edit it out, fine. But if you don't, I think that's also OK. Uh, but that got so much pushback. Like, no, it just used to sound stupid. And I was like, well, that's because you've been told <laughs> that that's what it means. But it's not about stupidity. It's about holding the conversation. Like, maybe me being able to say, continue to talk when you're trying to think of something else. Mm-hmm. And it's weird. I, I don't 
I take people more seriously when they don't sound super polished. Like I like the conversational mm-hmm. like back and forth when I listen to podcasts. I mean, you know, I don't expect it from like NPR or whatever, because I know they're going to be like really professionally done. But I like the like kind of indie podcasts where people, you know, sound like I sound like, you know, I it's there's like a it sounds scripted right yeah and, and so yeah, yeah, exactly. we can and so we can hear insincerity mm-hmm. in, in in it like yes, there is exactly. insincerity or not, but that's like so that the, the flip side is it you can polish it so much that it becomes insincere it sounds performative yeah. rather mm-hmm. than natural yeah and i don't think there's anything wrong with thinking about it and coming to a decision that works for you i just don't like the idea of everybody has to sound like NPR or yeah, everyone yeah. has to sound yeah, like yeah. this person. It's the, that's just not realistic. And also I, I don't like the uniformity of it. Well, and I mean, it's, it's also, it is a question of genre in a sense. I mean, yeah. what kind of discourse are you having? I mean, a lot of these filler words are discourse markers. Yeah. And if you're having a conversational podcast, if you take out all of those discourse markers, it's going to be wrong for the, mm-hmm. the type of discourse. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The reason, the other reason I wanted to bring up the cockroach, <laughs> uh, sorry, it was just such a colorful <laughs> analogy. I'm going to keep bringing it up. It was very good. <laughs> very good. But it also ties into the other thing, just to bring up a couple of, of points that I thought might be interesting. Because when I asked if it's inevitable, I don't know if it's inevitable in the future. What I do know is that it's been inevitable in the past. Mm-hmm. It's always been around. And yeah. the, the kind of interest, we both picked a couple of just examples of this kind of, you know, your podcast, most you do talk about the history of language sometimes, but you're talking mostly about contemporary or reasonably mm-hmm. contemporary examples. But we both, I guess we both sort of went back to Greek dialects for one element of this, but we both picked up sort of an example. I thought I'd share them with you mm-hmm. and we could see how things have not changed. <laughs> <laughs> the, de- the details change, but the content doesn't. So like one of the things is that uh, the Greek world is really interesting, the ancient Greek world, because we have evidence of dialects, unlike mm-hmm. Latin, where there was the standardization of the written form pretty early on. In Greece, we have multiple places that all kind of learned to write at the same time and wrote their own dialects down. Mm-hmm. And we have, there's a couple of sort of fun things that come out of that. One of them is the word... The word solecism, which we use today to refer to... Some people use. Some yeah, people this is one of those ones that my students would be like, what are you well, talking are you about? Talking? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the people who make the criticisms, right? Who use, who the, use the word solecism uh, to refer to like a grammar error or something like that yeah and, and there's a sense of like also manners like you've like it's a, it's uh, a faux pas in manners right yeah. you've made a solecism that, that's a that that word is a solecism that's a i don't know it's almost like it's offensive or something mm-hmm. to use the wrong word or to do something wrong and that word comes from the town a, a town in ancient Greece, Soloi, which the Athenian speakers thought uh, they were, you know, barbaric in their speech habits. And, and it became then the general word for, you know, someone who speaks bad Greek. Wow. Someone who speaks bad Greek. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> My other example is from Rome. It's of a poem by Catullus where he de- definitely mocking somebody for having an accent. And the funny thing about it is he's mocking somebody for putting H's on words that shouldn't have H's. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it really is that's, like that's. I, I know it's just an exact example that people still people still, people still use, that, yeah. and it's so funny because it you know Catullus like in Britain people were schoolboys learn mm. Catullus not the dirty ones there's some really really dirty poems but not those <laughs> ones there's the other ones like this one mm-hmm. and so it's been translated by generations of Brits all of whom are like oh it's just like Cockneys you know yeah, exactly <laughs> like, like it, it felt perfectly into their own stereotypes and their own discriminations of these public school schoolboys studying Latin who all used H's correctly. And so you look at the literature and, and you can see in the way that the scholars treated it for a very long time, they've all been on Catullus' side. Yeah. Like the language that the scholars use is all about, oh, he's mocking a rustic who doesn't know how to speak, a freedman who doesn't know, you know, like they're totally on the side of Catullus yep. that this other guy is absolutely wrong. <laughs> and Catullus is just showing, you know, how clever he is by mocking him. That's changed in more recent years, but it's it's because it lines up like even the actual mechanics yeah. of what he's mocking mm-hmm. lined up with their own presuppositions as well. Yep. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. So I just thought I'd sh- that's a uh, Catullus eighty four for those playing along at home. <laughs> to, to read about uh, 
That's amazing. I didn't know about that. But yeah, it's exactly what I thought of. I was like, oh, H, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I won't. It's a very short poem, but I won't read it all. But like the words in Latin that he talks and he writes them out are, he says, um, this guy says homoda, not comoda. Hmm. So C-H instead of co and he says instead of insidious he says hinsidious Mm -hmm. and then um and and he thinks he said it so well that he says it as many times as he can hinsidious (sighs) and and he says not you know he he says it his mother said it his mother's brother said it his mother's father said it like that then when he was sent overseas we all were happy because we didn't have to our ears weren't being hurt Uh, by this horrible noise wow but then Uh. yeah but then horrible news came back that terrified us all that after he had crossed the ionian sea once he had crossed it it was no longer ionian but hionian Wow, Catullus is an asshole. Oh, yeah. Catullus is a total That's asshole. Total of course, Catullus asshole. is an asshole. Yeah, I mean, he, his entire poetry is about in group, out group. Like, yeah. that's all of his poems are about I'm clever, I'm smart, I'm elegant, and all of the rest of you are chumps. Oh my that's what God, his poems are. Get about. over yourself. Uh, I love Catullus, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's a horrible person. Like, uh, I don't study a single person I'd want to have dinner, par- dinner with. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> But I love their stuff. But yeah, but like he does it really well. But it's just, it's so, excuse the word, classic. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it's it, every way he speaks about it and describing it to the family and saying that he, you know, it, what's worse is that he, he does it. He thinks he's doing well by doing it. He's trying to act elegant. So he's mocking him for being a social climber. He's mocking him, you know, all of these things right. that people do, all the ways it comes out now. And he doubtless got lots of praise for this wonderful poem and how clever he showed himself. Oh, yeah, for sure. People love that shit. Yeah. Now, to be fair, at Rome, everything was about hierarchy and competition. Of course, so, like, yeah. egalitarianism wasn't even a, there was no lip service even to that. So, <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's no surprise. But I think perhaps we should feel like if we still act just like him. What are we doing? Yeah. yeah. If we don't think we're the same sort of society, why do we still say the same things? Yeah. Exactly. I think partially we do kind of think we're in the same kind of society. We just don't want to say it out loud. Hmm. Yeah. You know, if our actions actually line up perfectly with the Romans, then what does that say about our supposedly egalitarian society? What does it say about what we actually want out of our society, which is the ability to say we're better than other people? Oh, yeah, we love it. We love to be able to Mm -hmm. say we're better than other people. Like I'm better than other people because I recognize linguistic di- tri- discrimination. So that makes <laughs> so just Sam. <laughs> you get a gold star. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I feel so happy. <laughs> Mark, do you want to tell us your your Chaucer? Oh well, it, it's just Chaucer yeah. reproduces a northern accent, right? And for for com- comedic effect, right? To show, yeah, and and we were both saying uh, Shakespeare does it too. Yeah, in Henry the does that, elsewhere, yeah. but lots of places actually. But Henry the Fifth is one where he he mocks the Welsh accent very explicitly, mm-hmm. and the people in the play mock the Welsh accent, yeah. and uh, then there's an Irishman and they mock the Irish accent. Yeah, yeah, so. and those those exact same things exist right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the UK, people yeah. still mock yeah. the Welsh accent or the Irish accent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these have long roots. And in, in like sitcoms and things, oh, yeah. you'll see a character who is from a different culture or a different class or whatever, and they'll be the source of humor mm-hmm. for the way they speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the yeah. United States, that tends to be Southerners. It is yeah. so yeah. insane to me how it's totally socially acceptable to mock Southerners for having Southern accents. It's true. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because we we do feel like we've made some progress in the past, let's say, 40 years, mm-hmm. like certainly gender wise. I mean, we can have uh, credit cards and we can own property, <laughs> <laughs> get mortgages and yeah. things, you know, I, can, I still can't believe that women couldn't have credit cards when, around the time I was born in the United States yeah. anyway. Um, my mom needed permission to open a bank account from her husband. Yeah. Oh my God. So we, we, ha- we have come a long way in certain things, at least. But we're still like mm-hmm. just digging down into the lingu- linguistic discrimination as if it's no big deal. So... Yeah, we we just talked to someone that was like, I listened to your podcast and I had no idea that I was doing these things. So, I mean, that's what I find happening to us uh, the most, actually, is people. People aren't saying, "Uh, I knew it, but I'm not like going to listen to you. It's more like, oh, my God, I had no idea. So, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other way that you can see this coming out is people who are very progressive and will, you know, attack, you know, someone right wing, like a, the way Trump tweets or something right. and says, oh, he can't even yeah, write in English that. or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it always makes me wince yeah. when I see that. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, there's lots of good reasons yep. to criticize Trump. This yeah. is Please not one stick of to the content. Yeah. Criticize the content of the tweets. Do not yeah. criticize mm -hmm. his spelling or yeah. his weird usage of it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's idiosyncratic. It's fine. Just let that go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you run out of anything else to c attack him on, uh, we'll talk then. Yeah. But until yes. <laughs> then. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it becomes, you know, it's the same as people using attacks on his appearance, yeah. um, on attacks on his masculinity, you know, like all of these things. I know, it's so um, upsetting. And it's okay because we hate him anyway. No, it's it's really not and I know I do it too yeah. sometimes. Like it's yeah. it's hard to avoid, especially when he's really ludicrous about something. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard not to. But I'm you know I am trying really consciously to not do it because mm -hmm. it's really a bad. Yeah, idea. it undermines our argument. But also, mm -hmm. <sighs> he's so mean. He is such a fundamentally mm -hmm. mean person that it's like mm -hmm. hard not to react in kind. Like, so yeah, yeah he mocks yeah. little Marco. Okay, well then you have little hands. Like, that's not a good yeah. strategy. I know, <laughs> I know. And I know, but you're, you're right. That's absolutely the impulse too. And and the impulse is, you know, he's so vain about stuff that exactly. attacking his appearance feels like the right way to go because yeah. he cares yeah. about yeah. that, exactly. right? And and so I get it. Like, I understand that. And if we're if all we're doing is going for character assassination, oh, OK, I guess. But it's it's not you know, that's not helpful. And also, and it really genuinely is true, even pragmatically, it makes people who identify with the aspect that you've just attacked feel that a, a camaraderie with him. Yeah, exactly. Or either that or just feel horrible about themselves. Yeah. Neither of which is a good is a good outcome, right? So yeah. when as soon as you attack him for something that's generalizable to other people, then people are like, Well, I talk kind of like that. Yeah. Am I, you know, so I guess I'm against you because you've just told me that people who talk like that are horrible mm -hmm. and stupid. So now I'm against you too. And also he you know? is just he's a really good bully. Don't try to out bully a bully. You will lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 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 you will hate yourself at the end of it. Yeah, like yeah. do you really want to win that game? Yeah. Well, so all right then, let's flip it around and say if we are becoming aware, and it's a long journey for me too, but if we are becoming aware that this is something we shouldn't do, and a lot of it's unconscious or implicit or learned, and this is you know this is where I I actually the policing the language policing I actually feel bad about it sometimes too because, you know, a lot of it is people who are aspirationally language policing, right? right? Yeah. It comes often from a place of a lot of a, a vulnerability themselves, mm -hmm. where they were essentially abused into learning these rules, told yes. that they were valueless unless they learned the rules, that, that, that by learning the rules, they have become valued and valuable, mm -hmm. and are then turning around and doing the same thing to other people to prove that they are not the valueless people they were told they were as children. Mm -hmm. Right. So then for me to come in and say, you know, don't do that, you're just showing how little you know about language, for instance, is not a tactic I want to, not that I'm saying that that's a tactic I use necessarily, but it's a tactic. And I don't want to do that. Because I don't want to come in and say, well, actually, you tried to, you know, I don't want to be Catullus saying, oh, you're trying to show how much you know about language by telling people not to put a end sentence with a preposition. Well, actually, I know more about language than you do, and you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? I, I always have that feeling because I technically I do know more lang about language yeah. than they do. I mean, I have a PhD in linguistics, yeah. but I always hesitate to to do that because it does come across as really like it's a well, actually, nobody wants to yeah. well, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's enforcing that hierarchy of privilege and of education and of authority and all of those things that mm -hmm. I'm trying to say don't do. And yet, so what, you know, what advice would you give both for correcting other or helping other people see what they're doing, but also for ourselves? What ways can we try to be better people about it? <laughs> this is hard because um, it's the exact reason why we have people like, like we invite um, Paul Reed or Kirby Conrad to our a podcast to talk about things that we feel like we can't talk about mm -hmm. and we can't say like do this or do that um but that's not really helping like when you're in the situation right like 
I feel like we just need to make room for people and and have these things that we can point to um, that are like, look, this person is in your community. And, and I thought I would share this with you. I feel like we just need more resources from people that are in the community and, and people with more privilege need to make space for that to happen. And I hope we're kind of doing that with the podcast. That's one way that we're trying to do it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it's something that we can really speak to because of our our identities. So, for example, Vocal Fry, like right. I will just tell people, no, you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like Vocal, first of all, listen to Jeff Bridges speak. And if it doesn't bother <laughs> you, then you don't actually care about Vocal Fry. Right. That man yeah. uses it like mm-hmm. to the max. <laughs> so, so if it's something that I can talk about as a woman, then I'm going to, I'm just going to say it like yeah. straightforwardly. But if it is, a, if it is something like, let's say it's about African-American vernacular English, like that's not something that I can speak to, but I can at least say, you know, there is a lot of science on this and it's, it's got rules just like every other language on the planet, every other dialect on the planet. And mm-hmm. it's unfair for you to judge this, you know, try to be as mm-hmm. dispassionate as possible and, but pointing mm-hmm. to, Hey, there's actual research out there yeah, on whatever it is. But then if it were um, an African-American person, I feel like you wouldn't say the same thing, right? Oh, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't yeah, say yeah. it at all. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't because I, then I would feel it would be very problematic for me as a white woman to say something right. like that. Mm-hmm. But if it's not, if it's not a black person, if it's someone else who is, mocking black people for the way that they speak right. and I feel like I can say something and I yeah. will absolutely yeah I mean that's 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 the that's the hardest part like again I wouldn't want to say anything to a black person either that's why I want there to be more materials available by, by other black mm-hmm. folks that are are doing the good work that are, that is you know making people feel like mm-hmm. the way that they speak is good and valid um, and share those resources. Yeah, but you still wouldn't be able to share those resources in that conversation, though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Even to say, "Here's something you should read," yeah. would not mm-hmm. be would not would not feel very easy. Yeah. Yeah. It would not come over go over well. And I, no. yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Understandably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds preachy. <laughs> yeah. But so, what about just from a leaving aside the question of of trying to confront these kinds of uh, language policing acts, which yeah, there's a lot of variables there. From a just day to day perspective, what are some things that you think people who don't want to be doing this do without realizing they're doing it? Like, what are common vectors of ling- linguistic discrimination that people who are not trying to, like you were talking about with your TEDx talk, people who are not trying to be, you know, are, are, are actively trying not to be mm-hmm. racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic? Yeah. What are some things people might be doing that they can try to correct in themselves or to think about to be more aware of i would say like anytime you're out in public and i don't know it could be as simple as like uh going to dinner and then the person that's serving you might have an accent of some sort and there are people that are going to um assume that maybe their english isn't as good Mm -hmm. right so that might be one that's your everyday Mm -hmm. life like you hear an accent accented speech that maybe like a we talk about this in the Chicano um, English episode where sometimes Chicano English is just is spoken by people that don't even speak Spanish, but it has like features that kind of sound like um, Spanish vowels and such. So maybe people will assume that they must speak Spanish as their first language and their English might not be as good. I think that we need to stop going to those conclusions. I mean, I do the same mm-hmm. thing, right? Um, everyone has these instincts to, to make these assumptions. Um I yeah. think. And one way to like stop doing that is to spend more time with people who are not like you. Right. <laughs> like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. grow your community. That, so, I mean, it's harder in some places than others, but wherever possible, you know, go spend time with someone who is not like you has, has a quote unquote accent. Everyone has an accent, but yeah, it's yeah. a different accent from you <laughs> or um, is mm-hmm. it different from a different community than you? And, and just spend time with people and realize that, yeah, they, they have, different vowels than I do, but I can still understand them. And so, for example, many Americans have problems with British accents because I don't listen to them that often. But if you spend time, like even just watching TV, you will start processing it better and being able to understand Mm -hmm. it. So, yeah. And another, um, if you like watch, I don't know, I was watching the Great British Baking Show or whatever that show is. Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great British Bake Off. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, it's getting easier for me to understand them, but still when I hear British accent, I'm like conditioned to think, oh, that's cool or whatever. Um, I think a lot of, 
I think a lot of people are conditioned to think that's cool. And then they hear um, uh, someone speak English with a Spanish accent and, and it's not as positive. So we can mm -hmm. start by thinking about how we react to um, accents that are different than ours. Like, yeah. cause that's mm -hmm. something we encounter all the time. And then another one that's like more like sort of like online or even signs or whatever. If you see a typo or you see an yeah. apostrophe that's a mistake, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, they, it does bother me too. But like, is it really worth your time to tell everybody, look how awesome I am? I, f I found the typo. Eh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. So it's not that you shouldn't do it like at all internally. It's just more like, does it need to be said out loud? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that sort of, um, I don't like the phrase virtue signaling because the people who use it do not align with my views of the world. Yes. But <laughs> there is a degree to which it is yeah. education signaling yes. or something. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to to point these things out. And I and I I have felt the impulse yeah, in my too. life. I am not immune to that one. <laughs> um so I think that's one that I consciously work on is I don't need to prove to other people that I saw it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then open the opportunity for other people to align themselves mm -hmm. with me by proving that they right. also saw it. Because yeah. I think that's part of what goes on. It's like people are sort of forming their little bonds yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that would be something that I would suggest to people is like, don't always show the admit and don't pile on when someone else. Does oh, it. yeah, definitely you know. not. Yeah. No. Um, I, I think it's important too to, to um, challenge the things that aren't um, explicit because that's an explicit example and the mm -hmm. the example I have of just like coming in contact with someone that that has um, a foreign accent these are things that are happening internally but it's really important that we start questioning our internal thoughts because mm -hmm. um, that can that can make us better mm -hmm. outwardly too it might right. not be obvious right away but I think that putting in that work is going to be good in the long term mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do think we bond over hating things. Like I do think that that's actually what yeah. <laughs> makes humans work. It's not so much like that you share and a it like. It certainly makes Twitter work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Like, well, and that, you know, that is, that's basic anthropology about forming out group, forming in groups by defining your yeah. out group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you could also think about this way that that's a, I mean, it's a survival mechanism and kids get that very young mm -hmm. and I got it very mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. and I got the, the message that the way my parents spoke, which my dad speaks Chicano English and my mom has this kind of Southern, almost African-American English thing going on because of how she grew up. She's not black, but she like grew up around a lot of people mm -hmm. that had that um, double negatives, both of my parents, all these things that I was taught in school were not good to use. So I grew up thinking the way my parents spoke was bad and, you know, kind of like put this mm -hmm. negative feeling toward them that I needed to speak a different way. So think about like how kids are growing up with these messages when we, you know, mm -hmm. perpetuate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're doing damage to the next yeah. generation every time we do this. We really are. And, mm -hmm. and that might even sound hyperbolic, but it's not, it's not, it's really not. Yeah. No. Well, and I, I see people, you know, I have a fairly large UK friend group on Twitter and, um, you know, accent discrimination is a very real thing, not just with Welsh and Irish, but very regional yes. within the UK. Yeah. It's a very real thing still right now. And I see them both participating in it sometimes, but more, but as, as often or much more often, I have seen them talking about like, you know, how proud they are of their Northern dialect or of whatever, and how they'd like hearing different dialects on the BBC or don't mm -hmm. like hearing it. You can see that the, the sort of shame and guilt about the way they speak coming out in other contexts and like it's a very active part of their identity forming and a lot yeah. of it's negative yep. yep and it's it's really sad when it comes out like that as being self-critical yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah it is yeah being ashamed of the way you speak yep. mm -hmm. yeah we like to teach people to be ashamed of things that are really not necessarily necessary to be shamed about mm -hmm. yes yeah no that's uh that's possibly the definition of civilization right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right <laughs> it's true <laughs> And on that happy note, <laughs> uh, perhaps we should draw this to a close because yes. we kept you for a long time. Um, and <laughs> while we could probably continue to talk about examples and problems forever, you do have a whole podcast for that. So we should leave you to <laughs> We sure do. So would you like to share with our listeners where they can find you on social media and where the podcast is at and uh, 
how they can hear more of your wonderful and inspirational thoughts on this topic. Oh, well, thank you for calling us inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I heard. What else did you say? <laughs> uh, nothing important. Don't worry. Uh, well, you, you can find us on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Tumblr at Vocal Fries Pod. Okay. And then to find our uh, podcast, I think you should be able to find it almost everywhere now. Like yeah. Google Play and iTunes and all those sort of regular places. Um, just mm-hmm. search for the Vocal Fries Pod because if you don't use the, you can't find it. Which yeah, oh, it's that. weird. Really? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, okay, let's have a whole other podcast about alphabetization and categorization because yeah. I have many views on yeah. things too. <laughs> and my dissertation was at least partially about the, so it feels like oh. it's mocking me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is personal. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Indeed. Thank you. We, well, thank you for having us. And uh, we look forward to the next episode. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've had such oh, amazing yeah. guests on too. Yeah. Um, some of your... Right? <laughs> we have great guests. And I also have to make a specific shout out to the uh, French-Canadian uh, episode. Oh, yeah. The episode on French in Canada. That was a particularly yeah. fascinating... I mean, I knew some of it, but a lot of the details of it I did not know and I found very interesting. Yeah, and We have kids in good. French versions, so it was very relevant too. <laughs> so. oh, fun. <laughs> Oh, and our next episode is going to be on accentism. So yeah, (laughs) it's really good as well. (laughs) Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. See you on Twitter. (laughs) See you on Twitter. (laughs) Yes, definitely. (laughs) For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.